this week's episode will be a little different from my normal format, more of an editorial. If you like this format, and would like to see more like it, please let me know in the comments. As always, please support the channel by liking this video and hitting the subscribe button. I originally didn't want to make a video like this because I know it's going to be difficult to obtain decent gameplay footage for it, given the length of these games and how all my late game saves are long gone. You're going to see a lot of beginning of footage in this video. Final Fantasy has inspired a long line of main titles, spin-offs, and side stories over the course of the last 30 plus years, and remains one of the most successful franchises in gaming history. How did it achieve this status among the pantheon of video game gods? Why is it held in such high esteem? Why does it remain in the upper echelon despite mixed receptions of titles released in recent years? Let's start at the beginning. I've been playing Final Fantasy since the first game was released in the US back in 1990. I was only 9 years old then, and while this type of game was definitely aimed at an older audience, I was captivated by the characters and the setting. You see, I've always been fascinated with swords and sorcery, high fantasy, and the Middle Ages. So when I saw castles, swords, magic, and dragons, I just had to see what else this game had in store for me. With the Nintendo Power Strategy Guide in hand, I dove headfirst into the largest and most detailed fantasy world I had ever seen up to that point in my life. The history of Final Fantasy and the story of Hironobu Sakaguchi has been covered in great detail elsewhere on YouTube, so I won't recount the whole story here. What I will do, however, is tell you what set Final Fantasy apart from every other RPG at the time of its release. First, the battle system was something totally new. While battles were turn-based, for the first time on a console, players could control four characters with unique special powers and abilities. A huge part of the game was creating a balanced party. This was not unheard of at the time. Many RPGs for home computers demanded this of the player, but it had never been done on a games console. Furthermore, the graphics were light years ahead of anything else in the genre. Sure, today these graphics aren't anything special. There are even many 8-bit games that look much better on the Famicom slash NES. However, when this game was released in Japan in 1987, it was compared to games like Dragon Quest II and Shin Megami Tensei, which didn't have the sharpness or level of detail of Final Fantasy. The side view of the battlefield was also totally novel, with other RPGs only offering a first-person or top-down perspective. The large sprites were ahead of their time, and while the heroes only had a small amount of animation and the enemies had no animation at all, it was still much more exciting to watch these battles unfold. Sakaguchi began a tradition of borrowing historical and mythical places and creatures for his Final Fantasy games. Today you'll be hard pressed to find a Final Fantasy title without, without Odin, Sid, Gilgamesh, and Ifrit appearing in some form or another, even if it is a form wildly divorced from how we understand them. Those references, however, are powerful. They lock us in by drawing on something familiar, but also curious. They evoke a familiarity but also a sense of curiosity and wonder. Final Fantasy gave players a huge world to explore, with a map that was five times larger than that of Dragon Quest. It was so large and vast that it required various means of transport, including an airship. On top of all of that, the score of the first Final Fantasy was composed with a serious approach. Even with the very limited 8-bit audio, the game is still scored like a feature film. This all is saying nothing of the excellent integration of both fantasy and sci-fi elements, which I have never seen handled quite this well before or since. Today, the original Final Fantasy probably feels like something of a chore to play. If you haven't played it, you might want to try one of the 16-bit remakes that move much faster. Here in the US, we had a pretty large gap between Final Fantasy games, so we didn't really see what was happening 
in the franchise, or even the RPG genre as a whole. While some RPGs were released here, they were mostly Western RPGs and definitely much more popular on home computers than on game consoles. The success of Final Fantasy in Japan, and to give credit where it's due, that of Dragon Quest, had carved a niche for RPGs that we wouldn't see in the US for two generations. Final Fantasy II and III brought with them several innovations that greatly shaped the future of JRPGs. Chief among them was the removal of dialogue boxes, instead opting for having damage and healing numbers pop out of the on-screen characters with an animation, a stylistic choice that endures to this day. Final Fantasy II introduced a swappable character slot, meaning a much larger roster of playable characters was available. Final Fantasy III introduced the job system for the first time, meaning that players could change their characters' abilities on the fly. This was a, this was a brand new concept at the time. Today, while some RPGs still stick to a classic class formula, most JRPGs encourage mixing different character types and many eschew the idea of character classes entirely in favor of a complete player freedom to build out the character. This has even found its way into Western RPGs where the hero can be whatever kind of adventurer you want him to be. Another huge improvement both these games brought to the genre was storytelling. While still in a rather primitive form at this time, the storytelling was clearly developing. Final Fantasy II tells the story of a rebellion against an evil empire and a secret resistance. Final Fantasy III told the story of a group of young people who rather accidentally stumble upon powers they will use to save the world from destruction. While these were hardly new story ideas, people had never experienced stories with such depth as an active participant. I would, hard, I, would ha I would hazard to say that this is a feature that found its way not only into other RPGs, but into all games, especially in the PlayStation generation and beyond, when story became a critical part of a game that could make it or break it. It wasn't just the depth of the story that was improving though, but also the way in which the story was told. Through dialogue that got more dense as the stories went on, and a more developed sense of who the characters were. Where, fa where Final Fantasy 1's party was a blank slate, 2 and 3 started to develop the player characters as having personality traits of their own. Their own feelings, their own struggles, their own motivations. They were no longer distinguished simply by which weapon they held, or whether they cast spells, but rather how they react to the crisis around them and their responsibility to mitigate it, and how they interact with one another. The 16-bit era is viewed by many, myself included, as the absolute pinnacle of the development of the Final Fantasy franchise. Not just because of the incredible trilogy of games that was released within the franchise itself, but also because of every successful effort outside of Final Fantasy. While the US will probably recognize only Chrono Trigger, Secret of Mana, and Earthbound as the biggest JRPG in his of that time, Japan was undergoing something of a renaissance of RPGs, with countless incredible titles, many of which were heavily inspired and influenced by Final Fantasy. My personal favorite, Final Fantasy IV, was released in the US as Final Fantasy II in 1991. This was a hallmark in the series for a number of reasons, most notably its active time battle system. While still turn-based, it added a sense of urgency to the player's choices. The clock no longer stopped while you were deciding what to do, and player stats like agility had a profound effect on when your turn would take place and how often. This really improved the experience of dealing with turn-based combat and made it feel a lot more alive. Even bigger than that, however, was the very large roster of characters that changed throughout the progression of the story, which was deeper and more nuanced than anything else we had seen up to that point. This resonated with me on a very deep level. Cecil's internal conflict had a big impact on me as a young man. There are two ways to live your life. You can be the Dark Knight and strike down anyone who opposes you, or be the Paladin and choose the path of perseverance. I think many people can relate to Cecil's choice, and this story, this 16-bit video game story, taught me more about life than I think anyone could have anticipated. It's a narrative that I think hit, this hit home for a lot of us, 
and it was just the beginning. Over the years, Final Fantasy would visit deeper and more nuanced themes, and explore them in a depth that interactive entertainment had never touched previously. I also loved the challenge presented by swapping out characters during the story. This forced the player to learn the strengths and weaknesses of each character, sometimes on the fly, in order to complete the game. Final Fantasy IV also introduced multiple maps. Not only did it have a huge game world, but it added two additional game worlds that the player could explore. Sadly, North America didn't see Final Fantasy V until the following generation when it was re-released, but it was nonetheless an excellent game. Once again, rolling out the job system, Final Fantasy V challenged players to find the best combinations to overcome each challenge. This also continued the trend of making characters the player could really care about. While the roster was not as deep as that of Final Fantasy IV, it still introduced characters who I genuinely cared about. However, I will confess that the story of FF5 was not as good as that of 6 or 7, or even 4 for that matter. Final Fantasy VI tried something really new by introducing a story that didn't have a central character, but rather it had an ensemble cast full of relatable, interesting people. It also deals with some very nuanced themes like racism, the loss of a loved one. It is also the first game in the series in which every character regardless of job or class, is capable of wielding magic. This was a huge revelation in the gaming world. Final Fantasy VI had character classes to be sure, but giving everyone the ability to cast spells was just another step forward in the evolution of the JRPG. Final Fantasy VI also features two worlds to explore, and a lot more to discover with the addition of the Auction House and Colosseum, which make it possible to grind for powerful items. Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VI also made great use of the SNES's hardware, with the Chocobo and Airship scenes being in a sort of primitive 3D. I think that used the Mode 7 chip. What a fantastic game. This generation is also where the games really began to come alive visually. Final Fantasy IV to VI were some of the best looking games on the Super Famicom slash SNES, and the system's excellent audio chip would treat us to some of the best in-game music to date. Even today, it sounds fantastic. I'm not going to break away to show the audio like I normally would, but I will have Final Fantasy music from the different eras that I discussed playing in the background. The following generation, I think, is what really strapped a rocket to the franchise. As much as I was a disciple even before Final Fantasy VII, chances are that you, watching this, were first introduced to the series by this fantastic game. Final Fantasy VII introduced some really heavy elements into the storytelling, including corporate greed, the danger of oligarchies, pollution, conflict over a finite energy source that is pumped out of the ground over 20 years ago. It also dealt with racism, genocide, war, and the trials and tribulations of growing up. There was even more, there was uh, betrayal, there was abuse, a lot of depth into characters and stories. 7 also ushered in the era of a very simplified player experience. Equipment sets are smaller, and any character can cast any spell, as long as they are carrying the appropriate materia. This decision mostly had to do with the technical limitations of the PlayStation, but it wound up being a defining characteristic of the genre during this era. A team of three characters who had the potential to use multiple skill sets became standard to party-based RPGs during this time. Once again, players had a huge world to explore here. Now, using a CD-based system of course meant that CD audio could be used for the first time in a Final Fantasy game. The result is a fully realized orchestral score, uh, a trend that continues to this day. With this new medium for audio, the sky was the limit, and they had only begun to scratch the surface. This was also the first time that a game on the PlayStation used multiple discs, and that became a pretty common... Uh, feature of a lot of games going forward, they knew they could make much bigger games by having multiple discs, and there are a lot of fantastic RPGs on the PlayStation that use multiple discs. The jump to 3D looks silly now, with the blocky characters on the map screen and the low-res, pre-rendered backgrounds, but at the time it was nothing short of groundbreaking. The exposition, though a, through a combination of dialogue and cutscenes, became a standard of the genre. 
Final Fantasy VII was incredibly successful, having sold 12.3 million units, counting worldwide across all platforms. Final Fantasy was followed up by the masterful Final Fantasy Tactics. I should say rather Final Fantasy VII was followed up by the masterful Final Fantasy Tactics, an isometric strategy RPG that often gets overlooked in the shadow of the main series. The huge departure from the narrative-driven grand adventures notwithstanding, Tactics also managed to tell an intricate story and create the world of Ivalice, a world that has been used in several games throughout the series. Final Fantasy VIII was a complete visual shift from its predecessor, using 2D character models that were intended to look more natural and human, and less like cartoon characters. The environments the player moves through are much more linear, and the camera angles are constantly changing, giving the presentation a much more cinematic feel. This elevated the storytelling once again and continued to evoke more challenging themes, like identity, a sense of belonging, and philosophical concepts like fate and destiny. While the threads of philosophy had been weaved into the series probably since 6, here is where they really began to materialize. This could probably be much better explained by someone who has more education in philosophy than I do. There is a book about it in the Philosophy and Pop Culture series, but it has mixed reviews. Final Fantasy IX was a return to form more so than anything else, so I won't argue here that it moved the series or the genre forward in any meaningful way. It was an excellent game, and continues to explore different concepts and ideas, both in terms of story and gameplay but I don't think it shaped the future of gaming like its predecessors did. Now, by the time the PS2 rolled around, Final Fantasy was well and truly established as a huge and influential franchise, and how much innovation this era introduced is debatable. Final Fantasy X and its abysmal sequel followed the ideas of VII by including cinematic elements and the power of the PS2 made it possible to have fully voiced cutscenes and possibly the most memorable intro song of all time. The first in an RPG to have lyrics. It would be disingenuous to say that Final Fantasy XI reinvented the wheel in any way, an MMORPG which is still online today but incredibly tedious. The once popular online game with five expansions, Final Fantasy XI never quite rivaled the success of heavy hitters like World of Warcraft or EverQuest. However, it is still praised for its encounter design, its heavy use of player-focused storytelling even in, in, in an MMO, MMORPG, and an amazing cinematic score. Its true legacy, however, lives on through its follow-up. I think Final Fantasy XII is notable here, however, for having a massive impact on the way that future JRPGs would feel. Never shying away from pioneering, Square Enix made Final Fantasy XII play like a single-player MMO, with lots of hub cities and dungeons, plus a system that allows you to customize how the AI handles your teammates. Even today, this game is great fun, and you'll notice that most of today's RPGs have a very similar feel. They are much more action-oriented, and they put the player in control of their members either directly or indirectly. I am sorry to say, but I think that Final Fantasy XII was the last truly impactful game in the series. And while I will praise Yoshi P and how he turned Final Fantasy XIV from an embarrassing failure into the best MMORPG experience I've ever had, it hasn't exactly shaped the future of MMORPGs. The entries on the PS3 era beyond and beyond have had some issues, and if I can play the critic, I think the franchise has really lost sight of what made it great. I don't want to end on a sour note, but I hope someone who truly has love for the history of these games takes the helm in the future and brings the series back to what made it so fantastic to begin with. Big stories, told well, with characters the player really cares about, and lots of things to and lots of things and places to discover. In conclusion, showing someone who had never played Final Fantasy what's so great about it today is a little bit like showing Black Sabbath to a heavy metal fan who had never heard them. They just seem like old RPGs now, but that's only because of the way they shaped JRPGs. Without Final Fantasy, the entire genre would be very different today. There is one intangible element that makes these games truly great, and that's a little more difficult to explain. It's probably partly due to very smart people who know just the right way to make this magic happen, but there's an emotional element to these games. For me, and I think for many other players, we connect to Final Fantasy because it makes us laugh, and it makes us cry. I can remember playing these games and being moved by the plight of the characters on screen. 
being afraid for them when all hope seemed lost, sympathizing when tragedy struck, and laughing in relief with them when the dust settled. It speaks to our hearts, and in this way, Final Fantasy franchise really is truly magical. This is escapism at its finest. Stories that bring the player into their world in the literary tradition of history's greatest fantasy stories, but also has a sense of humor and is willing to poke fun at itself. Each installment has at least some comedy elements and silly easter eggs, or fun extras. On a final note, I know there is tremendous debate online perpetually about which Final Fantasy game was the best of all time? If I am pressed to answer that question, I will have to say that Final Fantasy VI is absolutely the best game in the history of the franchise. The way the story is told has never quite been duplicated in the world of video games, and I've never felt so connected to such a large cast of characters in any work of fiction. I believe that Final Fantasy VI truly is a great work of art. I hope that watching this video has helped you to understand what's so great about Final Fantasy. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Leave a comment and tell me your favorite Final Fantasy memories. Until next time, game over.